Um, I had planned to take a break in here, but we're actually getting near the end. Are people good for us to just power on for another 15, 20 minutes or so? Okay, great. Yes. So um, the next, thank you. So the next uh, thing on the agenda is council initiated discussion. And before we actually start the discussion for uh, this May meeting, I wanted to come back and let you know that uh, we did hear the requests that were made at last February's um, meeting under council initiated discussion. There was a request to receive guidance and best practices about uh, international collaborations and how to report time and effort commitments um, with applications that involve uh, international collaborators. We actually had someone lined up to come present on that, but we decided it was more important to try to keep this meeting to a relatively short period of time. And it's also somewhat unfair to the presenter to have to present in this sort of virtual way. So we have uh, not forgotten those requests. We will bring them to the September council meeting. Uh, but for today's meeting, for the new council members, this is the point in the council meeting where we sort of turn the microphone over to the council members. We ask if there are reports or presentations that you would like to hear uh, in future council meetings about any of our research programs. Uh, we also ask you to alert us to uh, issues that may be uh, brewing in the field, uh, problems that you're hearing about um, in your own institution or from your collaborators that you think uh, should be, we should be made aware of. So with those uh, very limited um, instructions, I welcome comments from the council. Any reports that you wanna hear in the future? We did hear back in February that you would like a report on NIH wide research activities in the uh, LC research area and we will plan that for uh, September. Rudy, are, are there um, plans by NHGRI to try to coordinate efforts to um, harness variation as it relates to COVID-19 uh, predisposition and severity um, to understand um, host genetics and its uh, the uh, effective modification on this uh, pandemic? So that's a good question, uh, Terry or Larry. Uh, Either I mean, of you want to come Terry, in on Terry, that? Or just... Terry's probably poised the best. I mean, the short answer, Hal, is we're absolutely at the table in multiple discussions at multiple levels about many genomic applications uh, relevant to the current pandemic. Terry, are you available to make some comments? I, I am, but uh, but I think you've <laughs> you you basically covered it. Yes. So so we are you know um, uh, actively involved in those discussions. They're not things that are that are yet public. Um, but we're, we're moving quickly on them. You know, and I would also add, Hal, I'm sure you can appreciate, I mean, there's lots of discussions. In some cases, there's money identified. In some cases, there's money being pursued. And I mean, and, and also in some cases, um, we are aware of and um, perhaps we'll be coordinating with, you know, major international efforts. So it's certainly not even just limited to US or just NIH spheres. All right, uh, I have Raphael and uh, Sharon in the queue then. Raphael, go ahead. So regarding <laughs> the what you hear in the, uh, among other out there, um, there are concerns about from investigators that have become, it's become very hard for them to work during these times, many of them because of childcare issues. Are there any change in guidelines for say, progress reports or anything like that, that, that are we gonna be taking into account what's going on, at least for some you know, people who have these kinds of situations? We can look into that and get back to you. I know that notices are being published all the time. So I would actually say watch this space for um, updates in that regard, but if not, it will get back to you in September. This is Eric, I think the other, um, we have two, two other points that are related. Uh, number one, I, it's extremely unlikely there would be NHGRI specific policies that would come out. Almost for certain, there'd be NIH wide policies. 
and I would uh, uh, echo what Rudy said, very fast moving, lots of, I mean, a lot of discussions, fully we recognize, when I say we, I mean NIH broadly recognize the many challenges many people are facing. I would, I would, um, I, I would think Mike Lauer's blog and regular newsletter and associated website associated with the Office of External Research would probably be the place to be monitoring because anything that comes out policy-wise, NIH-wide will come through Mike Lauer specifically. This is Carolyn. I, I think I mean I think I would add on top of that that there already are a number of sort of flexibilities in terms of um, deadlines and progress reports, and those are in the notices. But um, we're also all open to hearing some of the specific issues that are impacting the community. And we have, you know, we we get some of those things and feed them up to Mount Mike Lauer, or they come in other places. And so, certainly, if there's, you know, as you guys net learn as council members, if you reach out to us with some of these examples, I'm not saying we can handle that. We're going to fix example by example, but understanding the types of issues is really valuable to NH, NIH as a whole right now as we address what's you know, sort of not just what are we doing now, but what are we doing three months from now, six months from now, et cetera, as we sort of move through this. And so, you know, if there's, you know, individuals can always reach out to their program officer to find out about existing flexibilities, but also to keep us informed of, of the ongoing types of impact and situations people are having is valuable for us to understand. Okay, uh, Sharon, go ahead. Well, I was going to make a non-COVID comment, but I'll just make a brief one and then say what I was going to say, which is that I do think we also have to be really cognizant of things like travel and travel costs. And I was just trying to book a flight this weekend, and it's it's a morass. So planning for the regular consortium meetings and whatever we put in our grants as reasonable budgets, may even if we're safe to travel, may not bear any sense of what it will actually cost. That was not, I just would add that to the discussion of other major challenges we're gonna face. My, my comment was actually very different. We had a really interesting discussion at the beginning of council about these two programs that are designed for master level students. Um, and it would be nice perhaps to have a summary. I mean, in some ways it could be boring, but I think it could be really illuminating of the different NIH educational or training programs and what kinds of trainees they are designed to uh, or allow to um, handle. Like we had a brief discussion this morning, the T32s have to be someone getting a PhD. Uh, because I think more and more, especially with the disruptions of COVID-19, students are going to be in all kinds of training programs and understanding better what the current NIH structures look like and which ones might be most appropriate to use to different levels of trainees, I think it would be helpful, particularly given the training working groups, you know, recommendation to significantly increase NHGRI's training footprint to try to think as creatively as we can among the existing NIH opportunities. Okay, Stephen Rich. Yeah, um, I have actually three comments. One, I'll start with the COVID one <laughs> first. And basically, uh, the conversations that I've been having uh, amongst uh, investigators as well as people in different institutes is that it seems like in individual institutes are developing their own sort of pathway to decide how to handle no-cost extensions, both for grants that end in this fiscal year, as well as what happens to the impact of being on lockdown for months at a time and how that affects you know, the progress in the research. And even if you have a couple years left on your grant, you know, if you spent six months or to a year uh, not being able to do something as well as you could, how does that work? And it seemed like there is a need to come up with a standardized NIH policy for a lot of this. And yet each institute seems to be trying to figure it out on their own. So hopefully there'll be something that comes out of the overall NIH effort uh, to give some guidance to that. Um, this, the second part of my three-part uh, 
of my trio is is actually you know I've I've been part of the genome sequencing program through a small project, but I think it would be useful just to have a uh, overall discussion or, or presentation about what are the findings from this project program uh, because it is multi layered it, it's different components and different disease uh, domains uh, an analytic component and. And it's a lot of moving parts in some ways, and I think would be very helpful to the council knowing just for the, the amount of, of funds expended on the genome sequencing program to get a flavor for what actually has come out of it. So that's one of the areas I, I would appreciate hearing and perhaps others as well. And the final- Wait, Steve, is this there, our, you're talking about our genome sequencing program? Yes. Okay. So, so first of all, of course, it's not over yet. So did you really mean to have an update before it's all of its I, It would be nice to know what's happened, you know. Okay. And, and, and are, you, are you interested? I mean, it, it also goes back, you know, 20 years. So or more than that. I mean, what, what time? The last five had? years. So you just want to know the okay. most recent iteration. And do you mean all yeah. the components or you mean just the Centers for Common Disease Genomics? I think it'd be good to have have all of it because you know the, the Mendelian component I think has been extraordinarily successful but I'm not exactly certain what has happened so okay. much. So you mean the most recent iteration of the genome sequencing program? Right. Okay. Right. Uh, the third part goes back to this discussion on masters in genomics and data science. You know we have a school of data science here with with Phil Bourne as, as the dean. It's been relatively recent there's been an explosion of, of students coming in and getting a master's. And we have these uh, speed dating operations where we try to get these students into our labs. Um, meanwhile, Bank of America and all these other places are trying to get them to come and, and do uh, rotations with them. And it's almost impossible to get these students into genome science, much less, you know, biology. Um, and I, in part, it could be the fact they can take a master's and start making $140,000 a year in a, uh, in a bank or some other area. Um, and, or it could be that there's just not the background. So I think it would be useful to think about how we can target students even before they get to the master's level almost. It's, it's like at the undergrad uh, area to try to get those people who are in this computer science uh, analytic frame, uh, frame set, to uh, frame of mind to, to get into genome sciences so that when they get into the master's program, they see genome sciences as a potential way of going forward. In our own, uh, our classes on uh, advances in public health genomics uh, over the last five years, we've had one person who of uh, 10 or 15 in data science is coming into our course uh, who had a background in biology and she immediately got a job at NIH uh, working in, in, in a lab at NIA uh, with her interest you know and also her training so these are entirely top-notch people employable but we need to get them earlier I think Okay. I have no solution. That's just the question. Uh, how do you envision a council discussion addressing this, Steve? What do you want us to do here? Uh, come up with a good idea. Okay. Okay. Terry, did you want to make a comment? Yeah, I was gonna, just going to speak to Steve's first point about uh, about NIH wide guidance on on COVID, which okay. You know, there is some, it, we ought to be a little careful in what we wish for um, because there are different needs across different institutes. Our programs are, you know, some of them are very, very different from many of the other institutes. Of course, every institute thinks it's different, um, but but also I, I think we're, we're trying our best to be as flexible as possible within the constraints of, of the budgets we have. So when you see NIH-wide guidance that's problematic for you, um, it'd be helpful, you know, specifically in genomic research be helpful to, to know that. In addition, if you see areas where you're really seeing a lot of conflict, you know, if you can let us know, um, we, there may be good reasons for that or there may not be any reason for it. And we can fix that. Yeah, and a lot of this, of course, is unpredictable. Um, 
it is. Because we, we don't know what's going to happen in the fall with COVID. And, you know, especially if you have people who are doing, um, you know, mass work and they have to spend months bringing back the mice only to have to shut them down again in case COVID comes back. You know, there's a whole series of, of if then else's um, that occurs. So a lot is, is not known ahead of time. So it makes it difficult. Jeff Botkin. Yeah, another COVID uh, question and uh, sort of NIH policy issue that I haven't actually thought through. And so, so many projects now have been suspended uh, in terms of uh, participant recruitment. So, you know, what does opening up look like um, with respect to clinical trials and who makes those sorts of decisions? You know, I'm going to guess the NIH doesn't, not in a position to say uniformly, but may well be things like Caesar uh, Consortium that uh, want to have uh, some coordinated statement about you know, when, when is it timely? And is that an institution level decision purely at the IRB? Is that uh, something that should be collaborated with uh, NIH? So it's a sort of general question about what sort of standards should we be looking at for uh, beginning participant recruitment in areas that uh, might be appropriate for that? So, this is Terry. I can start, but I'd, I'd ask um, those who are uh, buried in, in COVID uh, policies to, to speak up. I think Lucia and Jen have, have had some, some role in that, and Carolyn. Um, what we've tried to do, actually, is, is to um, encourage investigators to follow the, the guides of their institutions because this is such a local problem, and it, and it varies from locality to locality. Um, when we have consortia, we, again, have tried to coordinate across the consortia uh, in, in decision making as to whether to stop something um, uh, across the consortium or at individual sites. And I think, you know, because these are cooperative agreements and these are joint decision making models, we would continue to do it that way. Uh, but I think looking to the NIH to tell you start recruitment um, is probably not likely to happen. Carolyn, would you agree? Yeah, I mean, I think as always, there's going to be a lot of deferring to the local institution and a of course, if you look at a national situation, we also recognize that different localities are going to be in different positions. Um, but I, but at the same time, it does become valuable to think about that in the terms of consortia, and that's part of what Terry was talking about in terms of some of the unique NHGRI types of challenges that we're going to potentially be facing as we work through all of this. So it's it's a good point, Jeff, but right now, and this is sort of the advice we gave to the consortia is we're trying to continue as best we can, but we need to be in recognition of current local yeah. issues. And this is Lucy. I, I don't have much to add in terms of our guidance to applicants, but for example, CSER investigators, many of whom are working at home, are meeting on a pretty much regular schedule, working groups, steering committees and such, and um, really trying to keep tabs on where the different sites are at in terms of their, um, their own progress as well as what they can uh, continue to do to contribute to the, the consortium-wide paper. So I think it's more monitoring at this point. We could certainly provide an update later um, if that would be of interest. Good, thank you. Okay, I have Stephen Rich and then Sharon Plon. Yeah, just uh, to comment, um, we are guided by our vice president for research office in concert with the IRB. And basically they've told us that we cannot get into clinics uh, until they say so. And that time has not arrived yet. Um, I think that depends upon the individual institution and issues related to risk to the participants as well as risk to the individuals who go into the clinics for recruitment uh, and how they will try to establish the, the masking and the six feet you know, boundaries and things like that. Um, at our institution for the clinics we were interested in, uh, they basically have set it up so that everyone coming to the clinic sits in the car outside in the parking lot until they're called. Uh, and then they're escorted to the clinic. So 
you know, it's very difficult uh, to know how best to do this. And you have to also consider that a coordinating center uh, is also under other types of stress to try to keep up with that once it, they, things open up. So, so for us, it's the IRB and the Vice President for Research. Okay, Sharon? Yeah, I was actually gonna say something very similar to Stephen. Actually, this is actually one situation where NIH has almost no say. Um, it really is our local hospitals. And I would say NHGRI has a bit of a disadvantage here because what the hospitals are mainly prioritizing are treatment trials. And so, um, so for example, our study where we are providing results, we are allowed to still recruit only in the circumstance where those results were felt by the oncologist to be helpful to the patient's overall treatment plan. Um, but in general, most hospitals are going to prioritize restarting entry into treatment trials and interventional trials prior to what they might do for a genomic space trial. Any last thoughts before I close the council initiated discussion? Okay, 